I enjoyed the song on the projector screen. A little different. Everybody else enjoy that? Kind of free your hands to worship God? A few hands in the air here and there, I hope. I don't know, I sit down here in the front so I don't get accused of watching people. I've seen a lot of pastors that get up front and they, you know, they're, they're eyeballing people to see what their experience is like. And you know what happens? Then people start putting on a false experience just to please somebody else, just to make sure that they don't get singled out. Amen. That's exactly what happens. That's why I intentionally sit down here close to the front and I turn my back to you all so that you all can worship God the way that you see fit. Amen. But we have sang two beautiful songs of worship and praise right there to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Majesty. Oh, what majesty. Oh, what beauty and holiness to think of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in His resurrected and glorified body. The scars still there, but totally resurrected glorified amen and when I think of all that that means for my salvation amen I want to fall down on my face prostrate before him I want to fall at his feet oh my Savior my God my salvation glory be to God the majesty of Jesus Christ I don't know if you have sat down and just med meditated on the majesty of Jesus Christ, but it wouldn't be a bad idea for you to do that because He has done so much. His love is so surpassing, far beyond what any man could conjure up, far beyond what any of us could do. Amen. The love of Jesus Christ. The love of God. We sang that song recently at the youth group. I struggled through it with the guitar, but that was okay. We got through the song. The love of God. It's an amazing, miraculous thing that he could look down and love little old pitiful me. And little old pitiful you. Amen. So thankful for our Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to get back into our study of Revelations. I didn't even begin to scratch the surface of my notes last week. But I think I, um, I made it through far enough. We're going to proceed on. Um, I didn't bring my notes from last week with me for that very purpose because I would... Um, Maybe still be, <laughs> still be on that particular topic next week at this time. So at some point we need to move on. But I just wanted to give you a few uh, little notes, a few things to think about. I mentioned it, I think, Sunday night or Wednesday night. But really the church in Philadelphia is the coming out of the message of the unity of God's people, the church of God, and really bringing that, that unity into full light and full understanding in the day and time in which we live. The church of God, Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, it's referred to in several different terms in the New Testament. When you begin to grasp and understand what that is, then I would like for you to go back and read Isaiah. Because Isaiah really doesn't make sense until you start to understand what Zion is, what the heavenly Jerusalem is, what the church of God is. When you understand those concepts and you go back and you start reading Isaiah, you go back and you start reading the Psalms. Oh boy, it's a whole new book. I don't care how many times you've read it, when you read it with those eyes open, with your spiritual understanding open, it's a brand new thing. Amen. Go back and read Joel. Go back and read some Zephaniah. Go back and read Zechariah. The whole book of Zechariah. Oh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing 
to understand the church and then to under, go back and read those Old Testament prophets and see how they got glimpses of it and they got some understanding and they were given some revelation about it. Amen. And they wrote about it. They wrote about the day and time in which you and I live. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But this morning, we want to move along. Revelations chapter 3, starting in verse 14. And we're going to read through the end of the chapter. This is the final letter of the seven letters that was written. And before I read the whole thing, there's just one curious little thing that I wanted to point out. Right at the very beginning... In, in verse 14, it says, unto the, church, or unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. All the other churches, all the other letters were written, and they were addressed a little bit differently. All the other letters were addressed unto the angel of the church in such and such a city. Unto the angel of the church that's in Ephesus. Unto the angel of the church that's in Sardis. Unto the angel of the church that's in Pergamos. But you notice what it says over here in the Laodicean letter. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Do you notice the difference? I never had noticed the difference until I started studying it this time. Until I started going back and refreshing myself. There's a change in ownership. The other letters were addressed to the church. Who's the owner of the church? The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's the owner of the church. But this one here, the ownership has been changed. This letter says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Who's in ownership of the church in this age that we're getting ready to read about? The Laodiceans. Do you see the difference in ownership? One... Jesus says, that's my church that's over there in Sardis. That's my church that's over there in Pergamos. But here he says, I'm going to write a letter unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. In other words, I'm going to write them a letter about their church because they own it. And if you don't believe that's the right interpretation, you flip over and read verse 20 of chapter 3. And where is Jesus standing in verse 20? He's outside the door. Knocking on the door of the church. Amen. He's standing on the outside. Who's in charge? Who's in ownership of the church? Jesus? No, Jesus has been put out. He's been put out on the curb. In this letter, the Laodiceans are in control of the church. And I want to tell you that in the day and time that we live in, it's too frequent and too often that man is in control of Jesus' church. Amen. They come in, they want to set up their structure, their organization, their ways, and they want to do things according to their ways and their opinions instead of letting Jesus Christ be head and Lord and Savior of His church. They've set Him out on the curb. Amen. No longer the reading of God's Word. No longer anointed preaching. No longer the old time hallelujah and glory. We don't do that anymore. We, we're modern. We've moved up. We've, uh, we've evolved. Amen. They've evolved so much they left Jesus back there somewhere. Amen. Just wanted to point that out to you because I never had seen it before. I had read right over it. I don't know how many times I've read this passage of Scripture and I never noticed that Jesus no longer claimed it as His church, but He wrote it to the church of the Laodiceans. That ought to be a real warning to us in the day and time in which we live that we don't take over the authority of God's church. Amen. We can't. We can take over the authority of our church. Did you notice it says to the church of the Laodiceans? In other words, it had become their church. It was no longer God's church. It was no longer Christ's church. He was no longer the head, but it was their church. And that's what happens when we take control of things. It's no longer His church. It's our church. My church. Your church. That's why I can't stand it when people say, Oh, what do they do over at your church? Hold up! I don't have a church. How are things going at your church? 
I don't have a church. Or people come visit. I sure enjoyed your church. No, hold up, stop right there. I don't have a church. Jesus has a church. And it's the only church that means anything. The rest of it's just clubs. The rest of it's just feel-good things set up by people. Well, I just had to bring that out to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's read the scriptures. Revelations chapter 3, starting in verse 14. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. I think that's a critical uh, exhortation there in each and every one of these letters. Jesus closes the letter with that same statement. He that hath an ear. Do you have your ears on this morning? Are you ready? Are you listening for what the Spirit has to say to the churches? Do you, are you listening for what the Spirit has to say to you? Amen. Amen. Some of the message might not apply to you. But are you listening for the parts that do? Amen. Are you in tune with spiritual things? Are you ready and willing to accept spiritual truth? Or have you rejected it out of hand already? I ask you the question. Because Jesus repeated it seven times. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Amen. I can't make you hear. I can't make you understand. But if you will submit yourself to the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you that He can do a work in your mind and in your heart, and He can anoint your ears as well as your eyes. Thankful for His work this morning. Going back to the beginning of this passage, I have already pointed out to you that this letter was addressed to the church of the Laodiceans. Not to the church as it was addressed in all the other letters, but this one was addressed to a church who had rebelled, a church who had taken control and taken ownership of its own situation. This, one, this particular letter expresses that the ownership of the church is no longer with Jesus Christ, but the ownership of the church has gone to the Laodiceans. And that's why Jesus manifests himself saying, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Jesus manifests himself in a way that says, I am the truth, the way, the life. There is no other truth, there is no other way, there is no other life, this is it. I am the amen, the final authority, the true thing. The one that you should look to. You want to get your church back in order? You want to get your life back in order? Get rid of your own opinions, my friend. And give yourself wholly and completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I am the faithful and the true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. Come back, he's saying. Come back to me. Come back to where you have something solid to stand on instead of standing on your own opinions and your own ways and your own cheapness. 
Amen. That's what a lot of people have done. They have cheapened the grace of God. They have cheapened the authority of Scripture. They have cheapened their walk because they no longer abide with the true and the faithful witness. The word Laodicea means lay, or comes from two Greek words. And the first Greek word means laos, which is laos, which means a people or a populace. And the last part of that word, or the second Greek word, is DK, which means right or justice. People justice or people righteousness. People in control of what is just and what is right. People in control of what is acceptable and what is righteous. That's why Jesus manifests himself in such a way. People are always trying to be in control and deciding for themselves where the church is headed, what the church is going to do, how the church is going to act, what standards the church is going to hold. Amen. People always want to be in control of what standards the church is going to hold instead of letting Jesus Christ determine. Instead of letting the true and faithful witness speak to us. Paul warns us about this very mindset in 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you would, hold your spot in Revelations and flip over there for just a minute. 2 Timothy chapter 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Why? Because men will be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, men will be proud. Sound anything like the day that we live in today? Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Perilous time. Troublesome time. In the last days. The last days have been going on for 2,000 years now, folks. The last days didn't get started just here in, the last, in this century. Didn't get started back in the 1900s. The last days got started when Jesus Christ came and the church was established. Those were the beginning of the last days. But in one scripture it says that in those days it will wax worse and worse and worse. And we see that as we live. As we get older, men grow worse and worse and worse. And their desire for control and manipulation grows worse and worse and worse. Paul, what did Paul say? They'll be heady. They'll be high-minded. They'll want their own way. Lovers of them own selves, or of their own selves. That one really stuck out to me. I, I outlined in my Bible, um, one, two, three, four, five. Five of those particular characteristics that Paul named out there. The one was, for men shall be lovers of them own selves. The other one was that men would be proud. They would be despisers of those that are good. They would be heady. And they would be high-minded. And then I underlined, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. The day and time that we live in, we see that people love pleasure. They love anything that's entertaining, amusing, anything that satisfies and gratifies the flesh. Amen. You don't believe me? All you had to do is go down there Friday night to Edwardsburg, a little community right there, Edwardsburg High School. The wind was blowing 40 miles an hour. It was 30 degrees, and the bleachers were full. Amen? The bleachers were full. And they would sit there, and let me tell you, they didn't get up, they didn't go to the bathroom, they didn't leave, they didn't do nothing for two and a half, three hours. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You ask somebody to come, listen to the gospel for a while, study the Bible for a while. Oh, well, you know, we, um, I think I, I got to go somewhere. I got to go fishing. Um, hey, what kind of entertainment y'all going to have? You got a music group coming or something like that? 
lovers of pleasure more than the lovers of God. You got an amusing speaker coming? No, we just got an old Virginia boy. Amen. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. This is the day and time that we live in, folks. It is the prevailing spiritual condition of our day. This letter, this time period that we're being that we're addressing here is approximately 1930, somewhere in there, through the end of time. This is going to be the continuing condition of mankind as long as time stands. There will be no change. Things will wax worse and worse. Things will grow worse and worse. You are going to be challenged more and more every day. More and more things are coming into our lives to take our attention away from the Lord Jesus Christ, from His love, from His majesty, from His glory, and take away from that. I don't know about you, but my life has gotten so busy, it's ridiculous. It's calmed down a lot since I got rid of the business. This is nothing compared to what it was like then. But even now, I can see a little thing here, a little thing there, a little thing here. Hey, can you come do this? Can you come do that? Amen. Busy. Busy, busy, busy. And it's not going to get better. You're going to continually be challenged about your dedication and your commitment to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to His Word, to His family, to His church. Satan is not going to give up his, his effort to get us distracted and turned away, to get us cooled down. Reading on a little bit further in Revelations here, Jesus said, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold nor hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my house, out of my mouth, out of his house too. <laughs> but because thou art neither cold nor hot, I put in the margins of my Bible there, they had acquired room temperature. They had acquired room temperature. What happens? What happens to a body once the life has gone out of it? It acquires room temperature. Amen? If the body's frozen, if somebody falls into the lake and they're frozen, there's still some hope that you might be able to revive them, that you might be able to do something for them. Amen? If they're warm, that means they're living. But they had acquired room temperature. And I'm afraid that so many Christians in the world today have acquired the same spiritual temperature as everybody else out here that claims to be a Christian. They acquired the exact same temperature. And you want to know what's even worse about it? They don't even recognize it. They're self-deluded. Self-deluded. What did the scripture say? Because thou sayest, we are rich and increase with goods, and have need of nothing. Totally blind, totally indifferent, totally deceived about their spiritual condition. Folks, that is a terrible place to be in. One of the signs that your condition is extremely bad is to say that I have need of nothing. I have no need of spiritual things. I have no, my spirit's just fine. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to pray. I don't need to read my Bible. I'm doing just fine. You're in the worst condition you could possibly be in. The one that's down there on the streets, laid out, strung out on drugs, he knows he's lost. He knows he's on his way to hell. But people who time and time again say, I'm fine. I don't have any spiritual problems. I'm on my way to heaven. Let me tell you, that is the worst place you could possibly be in. When you get to the place where you don't think you have a spiritual need, Oh boy, you are in the worst kind of deception you could possibly be in. As I read this scripture and I studied this message out, I seen a whole lot of my needs. I seen a whole lot of my faults and my flaws. I seen a whole lot of my shortcomings. I know without a doubt that I need the Word of God more than I've ever needed it in my life. 
Amen. I need it to guide my steps. I need it to guide my thoughts. I need it to direct my paths. The last thing I would ever want to say is that oh, I'm good. I'm good. No, I need to be on my knees saying, God, help me. Point out to me where my faults and flaws are. Point out to me where I need to strengthen. Point out to me, Jesus, I need you. Amen. It's those that are hungry. It's those that have needs. It's those that want more. They shall be filled, is what the Bible tells us. That's what Jesus said. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Not maybe. Not probably. But they shall. That's a very strong word. That means it's going to happen. You can guarantee it. Almighty God who formed the universe stands behind that statement. They shall be filled. The prevailing spiritual condition in this letter in the day and time in which we live is blindness, spiritual blindness, spiritual indifference, and spiritual numbness. Spiritual numbness. I want you to think about this for a minute. If you've got an arm or you've got a hand that's frostbitten, as long as that thing is frozen, it doesn't hurt. It hurts when it first starts freezing, but once it's frozen, once it's totally frostbitten, and you people are from the north, so you should know what I'm talking about, but once your hand is frostbitten, it does not hurt. You want to know when it hurts? When it starts to thaw out. Any of you ever been in by the fire, your hand's frozen, and you start warming your hand up by the fire? You know there's some life left in there. But too many today are spiritually numb. They are frozen. Their hands are frozen, paralyzed, unusable, and they don't even know it. No recognition of it. You're here this morning. I'm thankful that each and every one of you are here. That shows me that there is some desire, there is some awakeness to your spiritual need. That you need some spiritual food. And I'm here to tell you, most of us, including myself, probably need more than what we recognize. Amen. I wish I could get a full understanding of my spiritual condition, of everything that I needed to do. I'd probably be overwhelmed. I'd probably say, stop, Lord, hold up, back up, give me one thing at a time, please. Amen. And so would you. So would you. We live today in a Judges 21-25 Christianity. If you would, hold your place there in Revelations and turn to the book of Judges. We're just going to read a couple of verses. In fact, we'll just read the one. Judges chapter 21. In verse 25, the very last verse in the book of Judges. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Folks, we're living in a Judges 21-25 culture. I don't want to see that culture move into this church. There's still a king. And his name is Jesus. And he's robed in majesty. And he's still on the throne. And he's going to be on the throne of this place as long as I'm able to keep him there. But what he needs to be is on the throne of your heart. There's a whole lot of people in Israel, in Mount Zion supposedly, in Christianity today where there's no king on the throne. They're in control themselves. They've got their own opinions of the Bible. They've got their own ways that they think it would be best. Let me tell you, you better be careful when there's no king on the throne. Because every man does that which is right in his own eyes. You are in trouble, my friend. Because your own eyes is not what you're going to be judged with. You're going to be judged with the word of Christ. Amen. Every bit of it. Are you doing what's right in your own eyes? Are you doing right in the Lord Savior Jesus Christ's eyes. We live in a pluralistic society where anything goes. 
as long as it doesn't offend me. I. Anything goes. As long as it doesn't offend somebody, it goes. I'm sorry, the Word of God offends people sometimes. The teachings of the Bible offend some folks. The preaching of God's Word offends some folks. Amen. But the world that we live in today says, oh, don't, don't offend nobody. Everybody wants to be catered to. Everybody wants their own truth. Relativism is rampant. What's true for you isn't necessarily true for me. Let me tell you, there ain't but one truth. It's either true or it ain't. One of us is wrong. One of us is right. The Word of God is going to be right every time. Never fails. There is no relative truth. There is nothing relative about truth. That, that is a contradiction of terms in the first place. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But you can't be relative, which means relating to something, and true at the same time. It's either true or it's not true. When it comes to things of moral character and behavior, it's either true or it's not true. Now, whether or not you like you know, a certain color, or you like your food prepared a certain way and it's better that way or it's better this way, yeah, that might depend on who you are. But when it comes to concrete things, moral things, the doctrines of God, it's either true or it's not true. Amen. So when I say there's no relative truth, I'm talking about biblical and moral principles. There is no relativism. The psalmist quoted it quite well. He said, Forever, O Lord, is thy word established or settled in the heavens. Therefore, Peter says, As he who hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conduct. So be ye a holy. Wow. Just like Jesus who called you, be ye holy. That's what the word says. I don't see any room for relative truth there. I don't see any room for debate there. Be ye holy, as he who hath called you is holy. Holy in his love. Holy in his faithfulness. Holy in all the characteristics of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Above all these prevailing spiritual conditions that we're talking about here this morning, Jesus proclaims, I am the true and faithful witness the beginning of the creation of God. It sounds very, fami very familiar and similar to I am the way, the truth, and the life. He reveals himself as the amen, the trustworthy, the final authority. Men can set up their own opinions and interpretations, but here Jesus, Jesus challenges, them, challenges them by saying, you may change, but I will never change. Truth is truth. And I am that truth personified. If you and I are not in line with his will, he will spew us out of his mouth. We already touched a little bit on the comparison between what they said and what he said. But let's go back and read that. Verse 17 and through 18. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. You know, one of the things that struck me, it says there in the first part of verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke. Even in the spiritual conditions that prevailed at that church in the day and time in which we live, God does not abandon or forsake his people. 
He still loves each and every one of us, no matter how numb, no matter how self-deluded, no matter how confused, no matter how oblivious we are to our spiritual condition. He still loves us. And He's still rebuking. He's still chastening. He's still knocking at the door. He's still doing all these things. They said we are rich. He said you're poor. They said we are increased with goods and have need of nothing. He said you're wretched and you're miserable. You're wretched and you're miserable. Comparison, back and forth. They said one thing, Jesus said something else. Who do you think was true? Who do you think was stating the truth, the obvious truth? Is there any relativism there? No. They were stating what they thought was the truth, what their relative truth was, what they saw the conditions as, and Jesus said, here's the real truth. Here's the faithful witness. Here's the one that's going to tell you exactly what's going on and who you truly are. And not only am I going to tell you, but then I'm going to give you some counsel. And I'm thankful for the counsel of God. I'm thankful that even in our spiritual blindness, He is still trying to wake us up. One of the first things that I notice, and it's not the first thing on the list, but down at the end of verse 18, it says, Anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Let me tell you something. If we're ever going to change our spiritual condition, we're going to have to see what's wrong first. Now, Jesus put it down there at the bottom of the list. But if a man don't see that he's poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked, he's never going to go by. That's why we need the eye salve first. Have you ever tried to put eye drops in your own eye? It's a very difficult thing. I find it quite painful. I don't know about you. But when I try to put it in there, it burns and it stings, and I have a hard time, you know. I really, we all have to prop our eyes open in order to give ourselves eye drops. But I have a very difficult time, because even when I'm holding it open, it's still trying to shut. It still doesn't want it. But Jesus didn't say that He would anoint our eyes. He just instructs us to anoint our eyes. He instructs us to do the work, to open our eyes, to see and acknowledge the spiritual condition. He says, anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. If we're ever going to see the spiritual conditions and be able to do something about them, it will be because we have opened our eyes to the spiritual conditions. We have recognized them and acknowledged them for what they are. As I said before, the worse off a person is, the more likely they are to feel themselves to be fine. I jotted down Judges chapter 16. I spent some time in Judges doing this study. And I was thinking of Samson. Because Samson fooled around with sin. Samson went down there and fooled around with the woman Delilah. And he got self-deluded, he got deceived, and he was blind. How was he blind? Well, three times the woman tried to bind him. Three times. I think after the first time, I probably would have woke up and said, hold on, she's up to no good. Nope, but he didn't stop there. He went back again. And then again. Three times he went down there and messed around with that woman. Do you think he was blind? Do you think he was deceived? Do you think he was spiritually deluded? Amen. And what happened after they had cut off his hair? He said, I'll get up and shake myself as I did before. And he knew not that the Lord had departed from him. I think there's a whole lot of people today that don't know that the Lord has departed from them. They think they have an experience. They think they have the Savior. He is long gone. He's standing outside the door knocking. And they're asleep, spiritually numb, deceived to their condition, blind. I couldn't help but think about that. He knew not that the Lord departed from him. He said, I will go out and shake myself as before. He thought he could just go out and do whatever it was. He could step 
right back into the spiritual condition that he was in? No. Amen. He needed some eye salve to be able to see the condition that he was in. That he had lost the blessing of the Lord. That he had lost the favor of the Lord. Spiritual eyesight or spiritual eye salve is one of the greatest needs of the day that we live in. When people truly begin to recognize their spiritual condition for what it is, then they will start seeking for the remedy to the condition. Without vision, there won't be any seeking. There will only be the same delusion that there always was. In Job chapter 42, Job received his sight. He said, I have heard of you, O Lord, but now my eyes see you. That's a beautiful passage of Scripture. I have heard of you, Lord. How many of us have heard of the Lord? But Job says, now my eyes have seen you. And then what did he say? Therefore, I abhor myself. When we start seeing Jesus Christ and His majesty and His glory, His love, what He's done for mankind, we will start abhorring it ourselves. We will get rid of any kind of pride, any kind of arrogance, any kind of spiritual haughtiness that we might walk around with thinking that we're fine, we're good. You get your eyes opened up, you're going to be just like Job. I abhor myself. And repent in sackcloth and ashes. Job was a perfect and an upright man. That's what God said about him. But when Job seen his own self in relation to Almighty God, he abhorred himself. Even though he was perfect and upright in all his ways, he said, I abhor myself. And that's the place that we must come to we must see our own true condition and recognize our hopelessness without the mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When Paul received his vision, he was on the road to Damascus. He got struck down, blinded. He went on down there into Damascus and a man named Ananias come and laid hands on him and prayed for him. And it says that scales fell off of his eyes. And what was the first thing that he did? Amen? Any, any responses? Some of you know that story. When the scale fell off his eyes, he got up and baptized himself. He didn't baptize. He went and got baptized. Why? He recognized immediately his sinful condition. He recognized his need for cleansing. He recognized his need before Almighty God. Here was a man who thought he was God's servant. He was doing God's will. He knew the scriptures inside and out. But he didn't know his spiritual condition. How many are like that today? How many know the scriptures inside and out, and yet spiritual blindness has set in to the true condition? As soon as he could see, he arose and was baptized. That was the first thing that he did because he could see his wretched, miserable, blind, naked condition. The Holy Ghost had came and convinced him of his sin. That's one of the, the roles of the Holy Ghost is to convict the world of sin. And that's what it did for Paul. The I salve in Revelations chapter 3 is the last thing that's mentioned but I believe it is the first thing that we need if we're going to make spiritual progress. Then Jesus goes on and says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire and white raiment. Every one of us need that truth in the inward parts. That truth that's been tried in the fire. That pure gold. That pure experience of God living within us. We need a committed experience that's been through the fire and has come out pure as gold. 
We need the white raiment. When I think of the white raiment, I see a twofold thing. First thing, we need to get all, rid of all of our filthy rags. Anything that we think we have of ourselves that's righteous, we need to get rid of that because Jesus got some white robes. Jesus got something that's real that he wants to give you. But I can hand you a robe all day long and it won't cover your nakedness one bit. Brother Jamie, I could give you a big old robe and you could hold it there. It ain't going to do a bit of good for your naked sinfulness. The robe is a twofold thing. Christ gives you righteousness, but take some effort on your part to put on that robe. Amen. To put on the robes of righteousness. He said, I will give you robes of righteousness. When He gives it to you, then you need to put it on. There's no point carrying it around in your suitcase or in your briefcase saying, I got my robe. You need to get it out. And put it on so that it may cover your sinfulness, that it will cover your nakedness and your wretched condition. Every one of us need to recognize there is nothing good in and of ourselves. There is nothing righteous that you have. There is nothing of value that you have to offer. But all our righteousness is from Him. 100% of your righteousness is from Him. He has given it to you. Actually, you have bought it. You have traded it in. What did you trade in? Your own filthy rags. Everything that you are, everything that you might have to offer, you lay it on the altar and receive that white raiment. I wrote here, Jesus said, Come, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire. How in the world that we are poor, wretched, blind, miserable, how are we going to buy anything? Have you thought about that? I thought about that. He just got through telling me that I was poor, wretched, blind, miserable, and naked. And then he turns around and tells me to buy something. Brother Arnold, that'd be like me and you going down into Port-au-Prince and find, finding the poorest man down there and telling him how poor he is, how naked, and how ugly, and how filthy he is, and then telling him, now, you get up because we got something to sell you. It, it, it seems ridiculous. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Blau. Sister Blau reads my mind. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. Hold your place, flip over there and read it. Because it is a wonderful passage of Scripture that will bless your soul that even the poorest, nakedest, miserablest, blindest person in this room this morning, the one that's in the worst condition this morning, can come and buy and eat and enjoy the things of God without money. Amen. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delighteth itself in fatness. That's how a poor, wretched, miserable, blind, naked sinner can buy something from the Lord Jesus Christ. Come buy without money. All you got to do, die out to yourself. Lay yourself right there on the altar. Lay all that you are. How do I know that? Jesus taught it. Matthew chapter 13, there's two parables. Two little short parables. If you don't read the Bible often, you might never know they're there. They're only like four verses. The hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. What happened? The man was in a field. He found a, a treasure of great value. What did he do? He went and sold all that he had. Everything that he possessed, he went and sold it. it. Sold it all. And invested everything he had in that piece of land that contained the great treasure. The pearl of great price. He went and sold all the other things that he accumulated, all of his righteousness, all the things that he thought was of value, he sold them. 
Why? Because he found something of eternal value, of great value, the truth. Let me tell you, the only way that a poor person will ever buy from Jesus Christ, a poor sinner, is when they sell all. When they get rid of their self. When they get rid of this attitude that I'm okay. I'm spiritually fine. I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Well, whatever it is that you think you're rich and increased with, you need to go sell that. You need to go discard it, get rid of it, and get a hold of something that's real. Gold, tried in the fire. And white raiment that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. What a beautiful picture here this morning that Jesus is trying to teach us even in the day and time that we live in. The only thing that you're going to trade in is your own filthy rags. And God sees your nakedness anyway. Your sin and deception can never be hid from Him. Adam and Eve in the garden, what did they do? They went and got some figs. Did the fig leaves cover up their sin? No. Do your filthy professions of Christianity, do they cover up your sinful life before the eyes of God? You're crazy. You can probably cover up my eyes. You can keep me in the dark for a long time. But you cannot hide from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He walks through the garden and says, Hello? Hello? Where are you? Knowing all along right exactly where a person is spiritually. You cannot hide from Him. So there's no point in hanging on to what you've got. Huh. The clock is not moving so fast today. Thank you, Lord. Buy that pure gold from Jesus so you can be eternally rich. Nothing you accumulate in this life, materially, will be of any value whatsoever in eternity. Nothing you accumulate in righteousness in this life will be of eternal value. The only righteousness that will be of eternal value is what comes from Jesus Christ. That's the only thing you will take with you when you pass through this life into the next. Jesus said, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. He's still calling. Even this church, that was the worst of any church, did you notice that he didn't say one good thing about these people? He doesn't say one good thing about the spiritual condition of our time. But yet, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. What a Savior. There's a song, What a Savior. What a Savior, oh hallelujah. That even in our poor, miserable condition, He still says, I love you. And I'm still chastening you. I'm still pursuing you. Be zealous, therefore. You know what that word zealous means? If you look at it in the Greek, if you you translate it directly in the Greek, it means to boil violently. The direct Greek translation is to boil violently. Jesus says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. What were the conditions? They were lukewarm. What was the cure? Be zealous. Boil violently. Get rid of the lukewarmness. Get some warmth. Get some fire. Get some zeal down in your soul. Boil violently for the Lord Jesus Christ. There's enough tepid Christianity in this world today. There's enough that don't know what it means to boil violently for Jesus Christ. There needs to be a stirring down in the soul of each and every one of us. Jesus is looking for a few radicals, my friends. Now, we hear the word radical and we go, 
because there's a stigma attached to that word. But Jesus is looking for a few people that sold out. He's looking for some people that are radical for Him. That doesn't mean you go out here and you act all crazy and you want to do something stupid. Not like the Muslim radicals that want to chop people's heads off. I've seen those kinds of spiritual radicals too. They want to chop people's heads off. Warning, don't go there. But Jesus preached for three and a half years and he got 12 radicals. And even they left him when the time came. Even they left him. But he says down in the latter part of that verse, he says, To them that overcome, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Praise God. The church that was in the worst condition is given the greatest place of prominence when they overcome. This church, Laodicea, this time frame that we live in, spiritually is the worst condition because of the blindness, because of the indifference. But those that overcome and come out of the worst condition, those that were the wretched, poor, blind, miserable, naked, what are they given? The greatest rewards. If you go back and look at the rewards that all the other churches got for overcoming, they got some wonderful things. But this church here was granted the most wonderful thing. They were granted to sit in the throne with Jesus Christ when they overcome the prevailing spiritual condition. Oh, what a beautiful thing. He who is first shall be last, and he who is least shall be the greatest. The mercy and the majesty of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Don't think that that comes at a cheap price, though. What did Jesus say there? He, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. And am set down with my Father in his throne. Think about that. How did Christ overcome? Now, we like to think about the picture of sitting in the throne with Christ, right? But let's go back and examine that overcoming a little bit. What did Jesus' overcoming look like? There's Jesus overcoming. Suffering. Beaten, bleeding, mocked, deserted. That's how he overcame, folks. That's his overcoming. We want to think about overcoming as all these spiritual blessings, all these spiritual high places and elevation and elation. Jesus said, as I overcame. When we overcame, overcome like he did, he overcame all the way to death. He didn't abandon faith. He didn't abandon his father. He was abandoned by everyone and left to die alone on the cross, naked, shamed by the world. Overcoming for Christ is not going to be a fun proposition. Overcoming for Christ is, all, is not always going to be physical blessings. But there's some suffering that goes along with overcoming. There's a cross that goes along with overcoming. There's dying out to self. There's going to be some times that you are mocked and made fun of by friends. There's going to be times when people abandon and desert you. There's going to be times when people ridicule you and call you names. There's going to be times when people work behind your back and undermine you and backstab you. Guess what? They did it to Jesus. Don't worry about it. He that overcomes, I will grant to sit in my throne. Keep your eye on the prize, my friend. Keep your eye on the prize. That's what Jesus did. He kept his eye. How did he overcome? He overcome with the cross, faithful unto death. He did not leave this world with riches or acclaim. He did not leave this world with popularity, but he made himself of no reputation 
and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and him given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Amen. When you're willing to die out, you're going to get that kind of privilege, sitting in the seat with Jesus. Amen. He still stands this morning at the door of your heart. I don't care how deceived you are. Jesus is standing there this morning. Pastor Fraser this morning. I've got some ISAV. Can I give you a little ISAV? Amen. Are you willing to put the eye salve in your eyes? Are you really willing to look at the state of your soul? If you will trade in your filthy rags, he will give you beautiful robes of righteousness. Then he will come in. And the word says, sup, in the King James Version. If you look it up in the Greek, it says, feast. He will come in and feast with you. Oh, what a beautiful thing. I think of supping, and I think of, you know, just a meager little bowl of something, just a kind of something just barely to sustain you. When I looked over there in the Greek and I said, that means feast. Praise God, he will come in and feast with me. He will bless me abundantly. He will give me more spiritual food than I could ever imagine. He will give me more spiritual understanding than I could ever imagine. He will come in and feast with me. Little old me. What a Savior. What a Savior. John 14, 23, if a man loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode. At the beginning of this letter, I pointed out to you that Jesus was no longer in charge of the church. You know, each and every one of you are the church. We collectively, as the body of Christ, are the church. I ask you this morning, has Jesus departed from you? Has Jesus departed from your heart this morning? Is he inside or is he outside? Where is your devotion to the things of God? Where is your fire? Where is your zeal? Do you still have that same burning love for Jesus Christ that you had the day that you received him? Or has he departed somewhere along the way and now he stands outside on the doorstep going, The door can still be opened. He can still come in. But I'll finish where I started out. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Do you have your spiritual ears on this morning? Are you listening to that soft, still voice? Can you hear that faint knock? We live in an era that's very tepid. I used that word one time already, but tepid means just kind of uh, wishy-washy, 
lukewarm, not cold nor hot. You can go just about anywhere in the world today and meet a Christian and they're all about the same temperature. That's scary. You can go to Haiti and you can meet Christians. Brother Arnold, am I right? What are they? Tepid. They're not on fire like they once were. You can go just about anywhere in the world today and you will find Christians that are just about the same temperature as everybody else. Are we any different? That's the whole point of my message this morning. Are you any different? Is your experience any different? Because if we're just like everybody else, we're in the same condition. We have assumed their temperature. We're no longer boiling violently for the Lord Jesus Christ. But we just assumed room temperature. Amen. God showed me some places where I assume room temperature as I studied this message, folks. So I know I didn't study it in vain. And if not another soul gets help this morning, I got help. Praise the Lord, I got help. He showed me where I assume room temperature. Amen. It feels good to be warm. <laughs> it feels real good to be warm on fire. He that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit say to the churches. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the faithfulness of your spirit. We ask, Lord, that you would just have your way today. Lord, that you would speak to hearts. We thank you for your faithfulness to continue to knock, to continue to chasten and to love we're so thankful for your love and for your mercy this morning that even in a day and time, Lord, that's so difficult, the worst conditions, we can still have victory. We can still have fire. We can still have you to come in and to feast with us, Lord. Thank you for that promise in your word. Thank you for the scripture that you have left us. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, that you would just work amongst us today. Examine every heart. In Jesus' name, amen.